and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I am one of your co-hosts, Jeffrey Garrett, along with... Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. And if you're watching this on Facebook, please hit that like button and share this video so others can see. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And if you want the audio-only podcast of the full episode, head over to our website, aotashow.com. We have the audio only and a bunch of episode extras and behind the scenes footage. Now, today we have another great episode for you featuring two very special guests. One, a professor of history and black studies. The other, a teacher who's developed a groundbreaking ethnic studies curriculum for her students in Los Angeles. With their expertise, we're gonna be examining issues around race and culture in schools. With the growing diversity of America's student population, what role do race and culture play in the classroom? How should they be present in what students learn? But first, we dive into some headlines with a segment we like to call the warm-up. iPhones are too addictive for children and Apple needs to address this problem ASAP, according to two of its major investors. Billionaire Janet Partners and the California State Teachers Retirement System, who together own roughly $2 billion in Apple shares, that's billion with a B, they drafted an open letter to the company stating that there is a clear need for Apple to offer parents more choices and more tools to help them ensure that young consumers are using their products in an optimal manner. The letter cites numerous studies from universities and child advocacy groups far and wide that show children's overuse of cell phones has contributed to a host of problems, including an inability to maintain focus in class, increased rates of depression and suicide, and a decline in children's physical and mental health. The open letter calls for Apple to address these challenges before its competitors do. Specifically, they asked for Apple to convene a committee of experts to engage in more research on the issue while also developing new tools, options, and education for parents to help them make more informed decisions regarding children's use of Apple products. Jeff, should Apple do something about children's apparent addiction to iPhones? Jeff. Jeff, what? man, oh, dude, uh, get it together, well, man. Welcome to all, all of the above. Dude, you you're useless, man. You're I'm, useless. I'm sorry. I was just see I was what in, I'm working with. You. See what I'm working iPhone. with. I was in my iPhone. Uh, in all seriousness, um, you know, I think it's important uh, that you know we take into account the fact that children are the most vulnerable members of our society, True. and as a responsible society, we should have reasonable regulations in place to protect them from dangerous things. On the other hand, uh, this iPhone is not a pack of cigarettes. It is not inherently harmful in and of itself in that, in that same type of way. So there's a certain amount of responsibility here that really is on parents at home as well. I often see, and I'm sure you see, very young kids with devices. Right. And I think we know enough now to know that some responsible parenting can go a long way towards addressing this problem also. Absolutely. Get those phones out of their hands. Now, next we turn to a story out of California. Uh, teachers have better work stories than the rest of you, or so it would seem, according to a new public service ad campaign be being sponsored by the California Center on Teaching Careers, teach.org, and the Ad Council. The ad campaign features dramatic retellings of the workday with uh, teachers covering the spread of viruses with zombie apocalypse games and uh, teachers uh, teaching how to add fractions with combat scenarios where kids have to outfraction the enemy uh, and comparing that with folks who um, are talking to their friends in other workplaces that maybe get invited to a big sales meeting or got salad wraps today from the boss. Let's pause for a second, take a look at one of these commercials. <laughs> Maria, so how's work? It was fourth period biology. Our students just weren't getting how easily viruses spread. So Ms. Bell and I had them role play a zombie virus outbreak. By the time they had all learned the lesson, all the living were dead. Hey, how's your job going? That big sales meeting I planned? Next year, I might get to go. <clears throat> cool. Now, this ad campaign is cute, but it's attempted to address a much more important issue, that being the major shortage in teachers that faces the state of California and frankly, most of the country. 
Over the last decade, enrollment in California's university teacher credentialing programs has dropped a staggering 70%. A February 2017 study by Desiree Carver-Thomas and Linda Darling-Hammond found that 75% of districts in California face teacher shortages in areas like math, special ed, science, and bilingual education. And the problem is getting worse over time, particularly in low-income areas of the state. Now, Manuel, it's great to see some greater attention being paid to the looming teacher shortage and to the benefits of our um, outstanding profession. But what do you think about this? Well, Jeff, this is one of those issues that just really just grinds my gears. It makes me so upset thinking about this teacher shortage because I witnessed firsthand dozens and dozens of teachers being laid off when the economy went south in 2008 and 2009. I myself got pink slipped three years in a row. And I remember thinking, all these people are being turned away from the profession right now. And eventually there's going to be, uh, there's going to come a time where retirements roll in and we're not going to have people to replace those teachers. And I remember thinking we're losing so many talented teachers off of these budget cuts that, you know, we're going to run into a problem. And here we are in 2018 now facing this looming teacher shortage and ad campaigns are nice, but um, this is a fundamental problem that we need to really, really um, do more about than ad campaigns. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Uh, the commercials are cool. I, I you know, sometimes yeah. stuff about teaching is hokey, but I appreciate right. these ones. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I do like the commercial for sure. It's a nice one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we turn to a story from the National Center for Fair and Open Testing, AKA Fair Test, who recently uh, published their year end review of assessment reform campaigns. And if you're re weary of high stakes testing, they have good news for you. According to the report, 2017 was a good year for opponents of what some call the testing industrial complex. Fair Test reports that only 13 states still require high school exit exams, which is down from 25 states in 2012. Various states slashed the number of exams given to kindergartners and high schoolers. 10 states now allow parents to opt their kids out of some exams. And seven states ended the use of student exam scores to evaluate teachers' effectiveness. The report argues that these changes resulted from clear organizing strategies, alliance building, developing clear messages about student success, and winning school board elections. Jeff, are we right to feel good about a decline in the amount of high stakes tests being given? Well, I think, Manuel, that the answer, uh, unfortunately, is yes and no. Um, we should uh, feel good about the sort of return to some general uh, sense of normality around the hyper testing culture that sprung up in the early 2000s uh, in response to the passage of No Child Left Behind. Um, in a world where things swung too far to the side of uh, the test is the only thing that matters, uh, I think it's fair to say we're, we're getting to a healthier place now uh, than we were. On the other hand, standardized tests are critical instruments of assessment in our profession. We have no other real means of uh, comparing outcomes across schools or across districts or across the country. And uh, being able to do that is critical to doing things like ensuring school districts are doing a good job of serving underserved students, students of color, students with disabilities. So I think it's good that we're getting to a healthier place, but we have to be cautious that the pendulum doesn't swing too far um, in a direction where we have no ability to make comparisons and, and have some accountability for our profession. Right. I agree. Not all testing is bad testing. A healthy balance is, is uh, something to strive for. So that's it for our warm up for today. And up next, we have a segment we like to call Show and Tell. Well, for today's Show and Tell, I brought in this clock and it symbolizes time. It's the time or really the lack of time that teachers get in nearly every school and district across the United States to, to adequately plan to meaningfully collaborate with their colleagues, to analyze data, and to address the myriad of other responsibilities that go into being an effective teacher in your daily practice. Now, across the country, teachers typically get less than an hour of individual prep time per day. And in too many cases, they get no time at all. In addition, when it comes to the valuable time teachers need to engage in common planning or structured, impactful collaboration with colleagues who teach either the same content or the same students, it's not unusual for teachers to get something like an hour a week or maybe an hour every other week, or in some cases, an hour once a month to engage in that kind of work. This construction of time for American teachers puts us shockingly out of step 
with the norms for practice in the highest performing nations across the globe. According to the 2013 Teaching and Learning Survey, American teachers work roughly an equal contractual work week to their international peers, but spend an average of nearly 40% more time teaching students throughout the week. Now, in a typical seven-hour school day, this amounts to American teachers spending about five and a half hours teaching, while their international peers spend a little less than four hours in the classroom per day. The balance of their time is spent on the critically important work of planning and intentionally improving their practice. A strong argument has been made that this difference is a key factor behind the success of schools in high-performing nations like Singapore and Finland. Now, with this data in mind, we are, I believe, facing a true crisis in our teaching profession. In an era where the purpose of schooling has shifted to promote college and career readiness for all, not just some, we must ensure teachers have the time they need in order to be effective at their job. The late Rick Dufour reminds us that the fundamental purpose of school is to ensure high levels of learning and growth for all students. And that in order to do so, teachers must work together in strong collaborative teams. In those teams, there are four basic questions that must drive our work. What do we want our students to learn? How will we know if they've learned it? What will we do when they struggle to learn? And what will we do when they already know it and are ready for a new challenge? When we layer the complex work of answering those questions on top of the range of other responsibilities that teachers have from putting band-aids on skin knees, to calling homes, to mentoring new colleagues, to running photocopies, there's a simple truth that we must confront. We have structured the teaching profession improperly. We have not ensured the teachers have the time that they need to plan, to collaborate, to analyze data, to review and refine their practice, to coach and be coached, and to engage in deep reflective thought about the incredibly important work that they do. Now, we can fix this problem, but it's going to take creativity, leadership, and bold action on the part of both teacher unions and district leadership. If we truly want to see a future where we are attracting the best and brightest into our profession, where we are retaining them and having the impact on our students that we hope to have, then we must ensure that teachers have the time to be effective to hone their craft as professionals. And that's my show and tell for today. Man, finally, man, taking up all my time. You know, I got these copies to make, department meeting to go to. I got parent phone calls to respond to. Man, finally, you done. What, what are that. you talking about? You've had uh, a full 37 minutes uh, yeah. today to take care of all those responsibilities. Yeah, nah, yeah you're right. I got to get on it. <laughs> the population of students attending American schools is growing increasingly diverse. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, more than half of American school children are students of color. In 2014, for the first time ever, white students no longer represented the majority of students in K-12 schools. Today, white students account for roughly 48% of the national student body. Hispanic students and black students are the second and third largest groups in American schools. Hispanic students account for 27% of the total student body, and black students account for 16% of the student body. Although more than half of American students are students of color, only 18% of our teachers are. The reality that America's teaching force is over 80% white, while the student population is becoming more diverse each year, has resulted in more calls for teaching and curriculum that responds to students' own cultural strengths and learning styles. In addition, some schools and districts are using ethnic studies classes as a means of focusing on and valuing the experiences of students of color. Now, while this movement towards ensuring teaching practices are culturally responsive and that school curricula reflect the identities and experiences of the students they serve has been uncontroversial in some parts of the country, it has become a flashpoint in some others. Most notably in Arizona, where Republican state lawmakers passed HB 2281 back in 2010, which specifically targeted Tucson's Mexican-American studies classes. Lawmakers claimed that the curriculum supported ethnic solidarity, was indoctrinating students, that it promoted the overthrow of the U.S. government, and that it created resentment towards a race or class of people. 
After seven years of legal battles in December 2017, a federal judge issued final judgment prohibiting Arizona officials from enforcing HB 2281, citing the law as being enacted and enforced not for a legitimate educational purpose, but for an invidious discriminatory racial purpose and as a politically partisan purpose. Now, there are many perspectives on this issue of ethnic studies. Um, and we are going to dig deeper into some of them today. So joining us to help us unpack the complexities of race and culture in American schooling are two special guests. First, we have Roxana Duenas, who's a secondary social science instructor in Los Angeles who helped pioneer ethnic studies at her school site. She also was recognized by the United Way Foundation as an inspiring teacher. Directly to my right is Dr. Terrence Keel, who's a professor of Black Studies and History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His recent book, Divine Variations, explores the complexities of an intersections between race, religion, and science. Thank you both for joining us. It's great to be here. Uh, to start off the conversation, I'd love to, uh, to hear from you both. Why is it so important for us to talk about race and identity in the curriculum? Why have Black Studies, Chicano Studies, Ethnic Studies classes? Well, I, I, I would love to hear what Roxana has to say about this because I think uh, as a college educator, we often get students who come into our classrooms who sometimes don't really have the skills and the tools to think critically about race and ethnicity and identity. And I think that's a missed opportunity because by the time our students are prepared for college, they are young adults with well-shaped ideas. And I think in many ways, teaching them to think critically about what it means to be a member of this nation state what it means to have a racial identity. The fact that we live in a society that is structured by race, I believe requires that we teach our students and we give them the tools to think critically about that world. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we need to talk about it because we aren't talking about race, class, and gender. Um, sometimes I think we kind of gloss over it in maybe a US history class. I know that when I was in high school, we didn't talk about it at all. Um, and so we need to, so that, just like you said, I think getting into, college, I realized that we had never talked about these things. And so for me, it was really thinking about what was the experience that I wish I could have had so I could have had a better understanding of society and I think how things function. And I think it goes back to thinking about how do we teach our students to think critically and to question um, all of these intersectionalities of race, class, and gender, and creating a space where they can do that. Um, I think, I don't know if safe spaces is, is, a, is a word to say, but in a, in a rigorous academic um, space as well. I think. All right, so spoiler alert for anybody listening to the audio only podcast, but we have four educators of color up here on our panel. And we're curious for our two guests, how has your own racial identity shaped your path towards education? For me, I don't think I ever saw myself reflected in the curriculum at our school. And I went to Garfield High School, which is one of the sites where, you know, you think about the East LA blowouts and the civil rights movement and their involvement in organizing these like massive walkouts with many other schools where like 20,000 students, I believe, walked out um, to ask for <coughs> culturally re relevant education. These things happened and I never knew about them until I got to UC Santa Barbara and took a, my first Chicano Studies class. Um, so for me, it's really important to think about empowering our students again with this information so, so that they can see themselves as active participants in our society and, and how they fit into it. Um, and so for me, that was really important because whether it was AP um, or any other class, I didn't see myself reflected in that. I think that's important. Page uh, 247 of that textbook wasn't enough uh, to, to fill your that interest? That one paragraph? No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think in my case, so Manuel and I, we share a similar background growing up in South Sacramento, which um, has a diverse population, but it's also a, a portion of Sacramento that can be really rough. And we had the good fortune of going to a really progressive, radical high school. But we also had the issue of by the time we graduated high school, Prop 209 was passed, which meant that affirmative action for admitting students of color throughout the UC systems in California was eliminated. And I remember really early feeling as if that I was not welcomed at the UC system and that my own experience and my own history and my own struggle as an African American didn't really matter for college admissions. So I went to a historically black college and it's on that campus 
dealing with really radical faculty who were thinking really critically with Karl Marx, who were trying to reimagine what our social landscape is, who were engaged in black theology, who were thinking about black liberation. That really taught me black lives really do matter and that to be an educator is about teaching ourselves and teaching the society about these sort of undercover histories that don't often get the kind of recognition that they do or they should deserve to. So for me, I really, I got the bug to be an educator in college and I think my own experience trying to represent my own background from South Sacramento really was a big part of my drive to wanting to be able to sort of share uh, the wonderful experience of black and brown people growing up in California in particular, but also globally as well. Yeah, I think a lot of what you're saying, uh, both of you really resonates uh, certainly with me personally in my own experience, uh, you know, having had a really transformative uh, time learning in an African-American history class I took in, in 10th grade that was sort of the, the launch of my, uh, you know, transformation into a, a political adult, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, and, uh, and something that really gave me a sense of affirmation in, my, in myself. Um, and I guess with, with that kind of experience in mind and thinking about some of the numbers that um, Manuel introduced us to at the, at the start of the segment, um, with students of color being the, the majority of students in the nation um, at this point, the question that comes to mind is, should ethnic studies be a requirement uh, for graduation? Uh, given the given the students that we now teach? I absolutely think that we should have, obviously, ethnic studies programs because I, don't, I haven't seen it exist in a regular U.S. history class, at least not more universally. Um, but I have a lot of questions about that, I think, and, and how it's going to be implemented. Um, it would be ideal that an ethnic studies class didn't have to exist because it was, like, interwoven into U.S. Uh, world government econ. Um, but I haven't quite seen it that way, so I think so. I think we definitely need to have these programs. You know, I, I think that we have to recognize that we don't live in a colorblind society and that we live in a society that's organized by race, it's organized by gender discrimination. And I think so long as we live in a society that is governed by these two very powerful ideologies, we need to give our students and our citizens the tools to think through that system. I also think we have to get over this idea that somehow the curriculum as it currently exists is free of racism and is somehow free of racial ideology. Truth of the matter is, if we teach American history and we teach Thomas Jefferson and not Phyllis Wheatley, for example, if we think about Shakespeare but also don't think about Lorraine Hansberry, we're making conscious decisions in our curriculum at the high school level to exclude black and brown voices and women of color. And I think that has a, a huge effect on our students, the way they think about themselves and their identity. So in many ways, the call for ethnic studies is a corrective to what is already a racialized academic system, both at the undergraduate level and surely at the secondary level. So then isn't there some danger perhaps in schools or districts maybe looking at ethnic studies or black studies or Chicano studies as sort of the corrective in the sense that perhaps that allows the mainstream curriculum to remain predominantly white. So in other words, uh, some critics of ethnic studies programs might argue that they do more to marginalize the population by keeping it out of the mainstream. What would you say to those critics? Either one of you. I mean, in my thought, I think that that narrative needs to be changed. I think that's a narrative that the right has been really careful at crafting to give the perception that ethnic studies is somehow marginal to American history. I think that the success of programs that Roxanne is, is developing and the work that you two are doing helps change the narrative of what it is to have a sophisticated conversation about race at the secondary level. I think we also have to recognize that in the case of Arizona, for example, it's really clear the opposition to ethnic studies is a way to disarm our citizens to be able to call into question uh, power relationships mm -hmm. and forms of racial discrimination that are actively ruining our students' lives and the lives of their families. So I think we have to realize that we are dealing with a fight, we are dealing with a challenge that has to be addressed properly. And I think these kinds of successful conversations, I think, help shift the narrative and give us a new way of thinking about ethnic studies. So I, I want to probe a little bit deeper on this issue. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the four of us up here uh, likely agree on, on many aspects of this issue. But, um, you know, uh, 
I think some critics of ethnic studies and, and the Arizona example that um, I read at the beginning is, is certainly a, 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 an extreme manifestation of this. One might say that the way that most, most ethnic studies are constructed um, uh, teaches students to think of uh, America as uh, kind of the, the adversary, right? Um, and that might produce a deficit mindset for students about um, the country and the history of the United States. So for the, uh, for the sake of this argument and for you know, the many people who in the political reality we live in in the United States today um, you know, might, might feel that, how might you respond to, uh, to someone who makes that case? And, and what do you think the, the case is to be made to them that ethnic studies is, is valuable and warranted um, even when we're grappling with these, these big issues of oppression and, and uh, you know, terrible acts in history? You know, in my dream world, I wouldn't have to like spend hours creating ethnic studies curriculum to address these issues because in an ideal world, there wouldn't be these structures of oppression and marginalization. Like I always tell my colleagues that I would love to spend my free time doing like art or like reading, but the reality is that as a member of a marginalized group and our students are right, that we have to understand these issues so that we can um, identify like the core the core problem, right, and to be able to transform it. And so just like you were saying, as long as these issues exist, like there's no way to deny it, right? And so being able to um, give our students the tools to be able to, to name it, to transform these issues, um, it's gonna, I think it's something that we kind of have to continue um, to push. But in my dream world, we wouldn't have to. We would all be equal and um, be able to pursue and feel empowered and, um, and be able to live in our full humanity, but that doesn't seem to be the case for a lot of groups. And so, um, it, I think we, you know, I think in talking about that narrative, it's always this idea that it creates um, resentment. And and I mean, when we look at history, I, I mean, I don't know how to deny that these are really uncomfortable things that a lot of us are resentful about. But how do we move beyond this resentment into a place of empowerment and transformation, so that we're not always having to to talk about these things, right, and moving beyond. Um, to a place of liberation, I think is important. You know, my thought is that I think this country has some maturation that it needs to go through because I think that in many ways there has to be an ability for us to recognize forms of injustice that we have inherited. The fact that this country has been an adversary to many populations. Be able to hold that in one hand while at the same time still recognize, well, what's the way forward? What's the way in which we can build just systems that avoid reproducing the racism and the discrimination of the past. We can't do that unless we begin with the first step of having a conversation about those forms of discrimination. I mean, I can't help but think about the fact that 60% of African American men who drop out of high school end up in our criminal justice system, right? Is that not a world where we have a society that is organized to be adversarial to those groups? And if you think about often many of these men are are become felons and therefore are unable to vote and are unable to participate in the political process, which has huge ramifications about who becomes elected in office, what kinds of policies we develop, the kinds of social programs that are created. It has a massive effect, I think, on our social landscape if we don't recognize the fact that we are actively living in a world where there are social laws and policies that discriminate. And I think we should have the capacity to be able to recognize that. I think there's a real danger to think that what ethnic studies should be doing is sort of valorizing Martin Luther King and valorizing Rosa Parks and Cesar Chavez and sort of giving us a kind of glossed, whitewashed narrative that paints these figures as sort of moderate people. They are not moderates. They never were. They were radicals. They had very specific social agendas that I think our students have the capacity to really understand. And I think we also need to sort of move the bar up a little bit and expect that our high school students who are gonna be a voting agent very soon, and I think our next election is a very important one, are capable enough to understand these complex issues. So uh, speaking of that, what, what you're both saying really makes me think of the, uh, the, the old expression that uh, sunlight is the best uh, antiseptic. It sure is. And that uh, in some ways ethnic studies can be thought of as uh, a sort of historical, uh, sociological form of sunlight um, on our consciousness. And, uh, and I, I think that's a really profound point, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear from both of you about, uh, given um, our, our electoral politics right now, 
um, given what just took place uh, in, uh, you know, almost a year ago now, um, have you seen any changes, uh, Roxana, in, in um, student interest or kind of the reception of the curriculum at, um, uh, on the Roosevelt campus and uh, on the UC Santa Barbara campus? Have we, um, have we seen any changes in the attitudes, perceptions, participation in ethnic studies? So at our school, every ninth grader is expected to take it. So, I mean, whether they're interested or not, they're going to be in that class and they're going to be discussing it. And whether it's this election or I think a any other time, I think our students come in really understanding and experiencing and living oppression. So whether it's this, uh, you know, this uh, particular, you know, president or another, I think once we start talking about structures of oppression, students are able to, because they're experiencing it as marginalized members of a group, once we give them the language, right, and the tools to be able to name it, there's this like, <gasps> this moment where they're like, that's why this is happening. Yeah. And then they're able to identify these patterns. Um, and so I think for students, it's really empowering to be able to then name these things that they thought they were experiencing in isolation, mm -hmm. but are part of these like larger so, you know, social structures, whether it's you know racism, sexism, homophobia, because we talk within ethnic studies, we don't just talk about race, we talk about all forms of structures of oppression and hierarchies. And once the students have this framework, um, I think it's really, and I keep on going back to the word that's like empowering because they have this moment where they're like, oh, this is why this is happening, or this is what I can do about it, or why is this happening? And I think the why, because one thing that's really, and we talk about with my colleagues, right, Paulo Freire talks about mm -hmm. these things are not permanent, right? And so once you tell them like some human, humans made these structures, and if humans made them, then we can unmake them, right? And so I think for students, I, I love having that moment with students when they have this, like, of, uh, of uh, being able to understand those patterns. And so um, in ethnic studies, I always, we always have those moments. So um, that's what keeps me, like, there, living for those moments. Yeah. You know, in my case at, the, at UC Santa Barbara, I've noticed two, I think, shifts. So when President Trump was elected, I was teaching a course on African American history at the time, and, and the way I teach that course, I spend a lot of time talking about Jim Crow, which is sort of the period after emancipation where African Americans were given rights to be able to vote and be recognized as citizens, but white Americans use terrorism, use white nationalism and racism to intimidate African Americans from voting and to essentially disempower uh, a newly emancipated population. And I lead the class in that way to say that we continue to live in a world that reflects these racist policies. So we can think about the fact that the way districts are drawn in Detroit, for example, which is one of the most racially segregated places in the country, for example, or we might think about portions of the South where African Americans have to fight really difficultly to get access to voting polls and to be able to sort of change their political position, not to mention the fact that Many African Americans aren't homeowners, and that has a huge effect on their ability to change sort of social structure. Oftentimes, when making these arguments, and I'm sure all of you have experienced this, you often feel like you're making an uphill battle to convince students, and particularly white students, mm -hmm. that we live in a world that's structured by racism. There's an, a, an, a, an, a sort of an exception of the King myth that somehow, after Martin Luther King, this country has progressed, and we are no longer dealing with racism. I think after Trump was able to win, on a platform based upon white nationalism and open sexism, it became very easy to, to sort of say, we live in a world that continues to be shaped by these ideologies. And I think that was a transition that I saw many of my students grappling with, but particularly my white students who I think were able to sort of see these connections. Secondly, I think uh, at UC Santa Barbara, and I think other UCs are also dealing with this, we are a Hispanic serving institution, which means 24% mm -hmm. of our population are Latinos. And so what that means is I think our students are recognizing that this designation means something for the institution of the University of California. But if it's going to really mean something in a climate where we have a president that's openly hostile to immigration, that means the administration has to be willing to battle and fight for students, particularly undocumented students, who are under attack at the moment. And I've, what I've noticed is that a lot of our students, particularly students who are from DACA, have organized and have seized this opportunity to call into question the legitimacy of higher education in a moment that's supposed to be protecting citizens, supposed to be preparing um, uh, them for the next generation, and also uh, protecting liberal values. And I think that has been a very sort of powerful moment for many of our students. They're really mm -hmm. taking control over their education in ways that 
I think, ironically, the Trump presidency has actually helped mobilize. Well, so then, with all that being said, 82% of American school teachers are white. Now, what role can they play in helping bring some analysis of race and culture and racism into the mainstream curriculum at this time? You know, the one thing that I, I'm thinking about is um, in moving beyond ethnic studies is, and as we move forward in, in thinking about th these courses is, one, we're asking ourselves, you know, who's teaching in the classes? And it was 82% right. of, of the population are white women, middle-class white women, I believe it is, right? Um, one question that I'm always asking myself is, um, what are teacher education programs doing to properly train folks to be able to do this? And it always goes back to these theoretical frameworks of, you know, critical pedagogy or critical race theory. And so I think, whether it's the school districts or whether it's the teacher education programs, how are we moving beyond like this multicultural education where we just kind of celebrate the holidays and really incorporate these critical frameworks into the teacher education programs and the training programs because otherwise it just kind of becomes this like celebratory, like let's talk about all of the great things that this person of color did, but not really grappling with the, some of the deeper, right. you know, more uncomfortable conversations about our own privilege, right? right? And I think regardless of who's teaching the class, right, I'm also have to, having to I name my own privilege, right? And once I do that, I think we're modeling for our students mm -hmm. to be able to do these things as well, depending on wh where you're coming from. So I think it goes back to the teacher ta training programs and the professional development that's ha happening in our schools from that critical lens. And just to add to that, I mean, I think, I mean, Roxana, you are really in the trenches of doing the kind of difficult work of trying to make this a reality. And it just seems to me that I also think for those teacher training programs, I think we have to also recognize as a country that whiteness is a concept, it's an idea, right? And so those who claim to have white identity are, are recognizing a certain kind of practice to be what we call a white person. And I think we are in a moment where that's being interrogated. We're, being, we're in a moment where it is safe and healthy to question what does that really mean and what are the consequences of being committed to a certain definition of myself as a white subject as opposed to something different. And I think that's healthy. I think it's healthy for owning a certain kind of privilege in the classroom. I think it's also healthy for the students who recognize, here is this teacher that has a tremendous amount of power over my destiny right now, but disarming themselves by recognizing the kind of privilege that they step, that they carry with them walking into the classroom. Perhaps I might, as a, as a student now, be able to sort of respond in a way where I feel like my presence and my story actually matters for this education. So I think this is a healthy moment for the country. And again, it gets us back to dealing with this question of it's fine for us to grapple with the messiness and the ugliness mm -hmm. of American history. I mean, James Baldwin talks about the history of any people is always complicated and always bloody and always messy, but that's fine. That's a starting point for, I think, redressing certain mm -hmm. kinds of harms. And I think that we can do this in this moment. Yeah, I'm very much reminded uh, from what both of you say about um, you know some of the the broad demographic realities uh, of our society right now that uh, the the strong majority of teachers in this country are are white women, and we know from the uh, 2016 election and uh, from some smaller uh, samples, the Senate election down in Alabama, um, <laughs> that we're also seeing uh, white women voting for some fairly reactionary. Um, and uh, you know, overtly uh, sexists, misogynists, uh, racist candidates. And how do we square these two things about who's teaching in our classrooms and what messages are being communicated to our students, um, not only students of color, but the white students uh, that they're teaching as well. Um, so I think there's, there's certainly much more to unpack there for sure. Yeah, and you're both each doing such important and challenging work in your respective fields. And um, we have one-on-one -on -one sit down interviews with each of you for um, those watching on our website. We have episode extras where we'll discuss uh, Dr. Kill's book a little bit more and also hear a little bit more about the work that Roxana is doing with Ethics Studies. So tune into that, that's AOTAshow.com. Thank you both for joining us. Great to be yeah, here. Thank you. thank you guys. Wow, Manuel, that was a great discussion uh, with our panel today. Was, um, to all of our viewers, uh, to check out more and uh, to hear more from our guests, please make sure to visit our website. That's aotashow.com. Uh, and also uh, follow us, like our Facebook page. 
Um, next, we turn to our segment we like to call the assessment. Manuel, what do you got for us today? All right, so no matter your political leanings, I think we could all agree that these are challenging times. There have been moments during the past year that it's felt like the whole world was on fire. Our students have certainly felt it. And for them, our classrooms are safe havens where everything can feel like it's going to be okay. Or at least they should be. I need to point out what I believe to be a really troubling piece of data about our classrooms found in Ed Week's recent report on teachers' political perceptions. A link to the report is on our site and in it, you'll find that one issue which educators have divergent views about is DACA or the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. You've probably heard a lot of wrangling about DACA coming out of Washington and I'm not really here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about what Ed Week found regarding teachers' views of the program. According to their report, 17% of educators oppose DACA and another 11% are neither for or against it. In other words, 28% of teachers are either against DACA or on the fence about it. Folks, that's 28% too many. Let us be clear, the people who are DACA recipients are current and former students of ours who grew up in America and came here through no action or decision of their own. And they are in our classrooms, their safe havens. If you were born in the US, I'd like for you to reach back to your earliest childhood memories and identify the moment in which you decided to live in America. Of course you can't, it's nonsense. In your earliest memories, you were just here in America. That's the same for the folks who are DACA recipients. Many of their earliest childhood memories are just here in America, the only home they've known. And DACA is a mechanism to help them earn a living and continue to be part of our American fabric without living in constant fear of being deported to some other country that they've never really lived in. And educators, more than a quarter of you have a problem with that? You mean to tell me that there are students who may have been in your class who you want to deport or who you are okay with having live in fear? I don't care about your personal politics. We're not speaking about any of that. We're speaking about students here. Immigration reform, foreign policy debates, political bickering, all that is for grown folks. And we're talking about youngsters. As an educator, you have a duty to serve and defend each and every youngster who you are blessed enough to have the privilege of teaching and have the privilege of having on your roster. You are an advocate and a defender. Don't let grown folks' business get in the way of your duty to cherish each and every youngster in your classroom. To the 28% of you educators who aren't on board with DACA, I wonder, is this a reflection of your general bias against immigrants? A kid grows up in the US, never spends any real time anywhere else, and you're not sure if he or she should be allowed to simply stay here and exist just because of the mechanism by which he or she landed here? So what does that mean if I'm a kid in your class who's an immigrant or who might assume is an immigrant based on my name, skin tone, accent? You don't think I should be allowed to stay? That means you don't really see me, my humanity, my purpose, my promise. Your classroom isn't a safe haven for me at all. I've been teaching now for 14 years and counting. As a teacher, I don't care how any of my students got here. I'm not in a position to judge them. I'm here to serve them. It's my duty to do my best to arm them with the skills and knowledge and awareness that it takes to create and thrive in a better tomorrow. DACA or not, if anyone comes for any of my students, they're gonna have to go through me to get to them because those are my babies and they're not the ones who lit this world on fire. We are. Richard Rothstein in his book, The Color of Law, writes that whatever routes we or our ancestors took to get to this point, we're all in this together now. And if you, as an educator, don't see that we're in this together, then you need to get out of the classroom. Wow, Manuel, uh, incredibly powerful words and an incredibly uh, timely um, statement on this matter uh, as this uh, kind of political football of DACA is being tossed around. Uh, the consequences are really playing out in schools and communities across the country. And this is just, this is a problem that we must solve. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, folks, we have made it to the end of our show and what an episode it was. We talked about everything today, iPhones and race and culture in the classroom uh, and all of the above. Uh, now we close out the show with a segment we call The Dismissal. Manuel, what do you got for us? 
All right, so shout out to middle school teacher Miss Hargrave, who was detained and handcuffed in a school board meeting after objecting to a superintendent's new contract, which reportedly included a $38,000 pay raise and a new car. Miss Hargrave spoke out against the board's vote and was arrested, saying later in a Facebook video, I was always taught that what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And when you see something, you should say it's wrong, even though it doesn't involve you. Not all heroes wear capes. Mm. Shout out. Shout out for sure. Now, I want to give a special shout out to the nearly 600 volunteers, overwhelmingly black and Latino men in Dallas, Texas, who answered the call when Billy Earl Dade Middle School asked for support at their December Breakfast with Dads event. Worried that some boys at the school wouldn't have a father figure to accompany them, they asked for community support from 50 volunteers, and did they ever get it? In fact, they got it tenfold. Also, shout out to the school's principal, Tracy Washington, and the event organizer, the Reverend Donald Parrish Jr. In a world where far too often what you see online and on the news is images of black and brown men that are just negative, um, you know, this story showing overwhelming support to the school for these amazing young men and the adult men of the community who are willing to go above and beyond is just simply wonderful. It's good for the soul and a beautiful example of the power and pride in our communities across the country. Now, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we yes. love having you here on the show with us. Um, please like our page. Please follow us. And always remember, you can check out more at any time at our website. That's AOTAshow.com. And new edition for those of you who uh, want to check out the episodes but are in the car on your commute, um, we will have an audio only version of the show available for you as well. Again, at our website, that's AOTAshow.com.